All right, thank you, Samantha. Well, I'm delighted to be here to have a discussion with you about a very important topic that's impacting all of us today, which is screen addiction. And as we well know, during the pandemic, there's been an astronomical rise in digital space occupancy, and for many good reasons. For example, the internet has become a critical tool for the access and education. Work Zoom calls, still continue with many of those, aren't we? Live stream mass, talk about purification of the internet. Catholic documentaries and children's programmings, social interaction and cultural events. However, too much of a good thing contributes to negative effects for screen use, even before the pandemic. So in this presentation tonight, I will consider statistics and psychosocial effects related to the use of digital devices in America, some neurobiological components, which research is demonstrating, explains how excessive use of internet is altering the process of self-regulation, similar to what is seen in substance abuse disorders, and how to place our increased reliance on screens in right balance with our life values, that is, our relationships with one another and with God. First most, I want to say that the Catholic Church embraces all that is good in the new internet technologies and seeks to engage persons with this media as a means of inviting persons to a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Pope Francis said, the internet is something truly good, a gift from God. He also cautioned that the high-speed world of digital social media needed to be a calm reflection of tenderness if it was to be a network, not of wires, but of people. Despite the many benefits of screen time, there is a downside when too much and too soon exposure becomes part of our daily routine. Consider these statistics. On the average, an adult unlocks his or her phone 160 times a day. In a 12 hour day, that's about once every four and a half minutes. And 50% of adults check their phone in the middle of the night. Those who are between 18 and 24 unlock their phones twice as often and 75% of them say that they check their phones in the middle of the night. Millennials say that they spend two or more hours per day looking at their phones for personal activities. And this has caused employers to really be concerned about employee productivity, given that could be you know, a good percentage of their workday. And the average user swipes or taps or touches their phone 2,617 times a day. So this is a pattern that's become very ingrained in our human behavior that was not really the case before the internet became available. And even toddlers are not exempt. A study was done by the American Academy of Pediatrics looking at when um, children first interact with digital media and guess what they found as the age at which this was really beginning to happen? I know you're muted, so we just kind of privately take a guess. And it was four months of age. So that's really young where these phones are put into the cribs like you see here. And apparently 44% of children under one use a mobile device on a daily basis, play games, watch videos, or use apps. And this goes up to 77% in two-year-olds. So parents or caregivers are really using these tools to give to the children at a very young age. So what are some of the effects on human behaviors that are related to the growing frequency of media in kids and teens? Well, one thing, again, that the American Academy of Pediatrics has noted is that children under 18 months of age who are given digital devices end up talking later and talking less. And what do you think that might be? But when you think of, you know, an iPhone, for example, there's a lot of visual and auditory data that comes at this young child that they're too young to process. And so there's not, you know, the opportunity to learn. So it's, it's they're not talking, it's passive reception of all this information. 
and then not surprising as they get a little older, then they have more limited face-to-face -face interactions because they're not taught turn-taking or kind of that social interaction with another human being because they've been exposed to what catches their attention they really can't understand yet at the very young age. And this is saying that concern with 18 month old um, children, as you see here cited. Not surprisingly, when they go to school, they have trouble with or doing writing, you know, writing an essay, writing a paragraph. And some kids even describe feeling bored when reading a book or feeling lonely. I know that those of us who were born before the internet certainly didn't describe being bored when reading a book. It might not have been interesting, but they just really didn't feel lonely or isolated per se. And teachers who are in a classroom where kids are able to use your cell phone feel like they're always competing to get the attention of the students in order for them to learn anything. Again, the American Pediatric Academy of Pediatrics say that kids who are given uh, digital devices at a very young age really don't learn also conflict resolution because they're not face to face on a play yard and learning more maybe the consequences of having an argument with another. And so they um, are. They have more problems with uh, frustration intolerance, so to speak. So these are things that um, are being looked at now with um, a more deep lens to see, you know, what is a healthy amount of screen time and what is it maybe is not so good for reasons that we just didn't appreciate because, you know, the internet only has come into existence. You know, again, you're in mute, but when did the internet become available? And it was only around 1991. So in a short 30 years, how much it's affected human behavior. And I'll go a little bit later about some of the neurophysiology as well. It's also affected very much sleep. Um, it's now said that two thirds of Americans suffer with chronic sleep deprivation. And this is increasingly the case with a rising wake of smartphones and e-readers and other light emanating devices. And persons are now in bed at night, you know, they hear a ding or they hear a buzz and they wanna see who texted them or who posted something on some of the social media sites such that it's arousing them or, you know, they're playing internet games or something like that so that they're getting less sleep. And the average is about 45 minutes to an hour less sleep. That's much more common. And this is affecting very young children because they're also permitted to have these devices in their bed. Um, some of the more concerning effects of, of the internet is when persons then are accessing sexting. Um, and with sexting, as you probably know, it's the sending or posting of nude or semi-nude texts or pictures or videos of themselves. And so they've looked at the number of teenagers that would sext and the average is about 22%. Um, and they looked at the teenage boys, and it's about 18% of boys who also sexed. Then they wanted to look at the same group of individuals, now that they're young adults, they're a little bit more mature, they're between the ages of 20 and 26, and what happened to this percentage of sexting? And so they had certain guesses, but what they found is that if a teenager, if the 22% of teenagers sexted, then as young women, it goes up to 36%. And if 18% of teenage boys sex, it goes up to 31%. So as they're maturing and getting older, there's a significant increase in the number of these individuals that are sexting. And it can be hard for teens and young adults to grasp the permanent consequences of their interactions because sexting becomes a legal issue if they've sent some of these images before they were age 18 and it could place them at risk of at being in possession of child pornography. And as you well know, what's something on the internet is almost impossible to completely um, discard it on the internet. And it can come back and haunt you even though you're no longer a teenager. It's also something that um, more college colleges or prospective employers are looking at. They're looking at social media postings. And if they're not sure who to hire, they're looking at what they've done to decide if maybe an applicant's suitability points to red flags or poor judgment, and then maybe not having them be accepted to a university or not hired for a job. 
Cyberbullying is on the rise. It's now at least 60% of teenagers describe being cyberbullied and 25% of them repeatedly and 50% of them never tell their parents. Why? Because they're afraid their phone will be taken away. So I tell parents, um, you know, those that work with kids, um, teachers, um, to please talk to, you know, young children or teens about cyberbullying. They they're not alone in this. There are ways to address it because it's something that they're afraid of. And um, they, these individuals have increased uh, rates of depression, anxiety, and especially now suicidal tendencies. We also see more a lot of um, um, sex trafficking. Um, and most of the victims are between the ages of 13 and 17. More are women. And yet now more there are boys that are also being sexted um, in trafficking. Um, and sexting is only behind drugs as a growing industry. And drugs and sexting often go together so often. Um, so this is something to really look at. Another area that's increasing is um, I'm now finding more and more of my own mental health professionals seeing individuals presenting for therapy to address their increasing urge to view internet pornography. And the statistics are hard to find and they're less accurate, just so many of them. But I've been doing this work for 20, 25 years and every year I look up statistics. Sex is the number one search topic on the internet. These numbers are low, but they give you an idea that in America, it's at least 68 million daily pornographic search engine requests, 40 million adults regular view internet pornography, 10% admit to being addicted. And so that means there's many more because most people don't admit if they're addicted. And Pornhub is the big pornography site that was released in 2015. There are 2.4 million visitors per hour in 2016. And today there's more than 120 million daily visits. And most of them have to do with um, the, the pornography related to women and children. And so there's, this is a main sex trafficking site right now, um, which is very sad. Um, to put it in perspective, it's as if um, Pornhub were equal to the combined populations of Canada, Poland, and Australia, all visited Pornhub every day. So it's a very popular site that somehow has not been able to be gotten under control that is used for um, sex trafficking. Also, 64% of college men and 18% of college women spend online internet sex um, on a regular basis. So they have sex you know, via the webcam uh, with persons that they don't necessarily know. Um, and half of the individuals who are seeking a divorce have a, one of the spouses have an obsessive interest in pornographic websites. And persons though do recover from internet pornography addiction. I'm, I'm here to tell you it's very treatable. It's a lot of work, but it's very treatable. And once they do get treatment, they report being more social, less anxious, increased productivity, greater desire to engage in real life romantic relationships, which is really wonderful. The sad part is this is what they're robbed of once they become addicted. And so it's really something to look at that we need to be able to bring out in the open to give a safe place to give voice to because so that people can get some help with this because again, it's very treatable. It's hitting a younger demographic. Um, the average age now is said to be about nine years old. When I first started this, it was 14 years old. It went down to 11 years old. And those of us who do work know clearly that persons for three and four and five years old are exposed to internet pornography. And it's said today that youth have more access to internet pornography in eight hours than their great grandparents had access in their lifetime. And 28% of boys and 18% of girls view, view bestiality online. That's having sex with animals. 39% of boys and 23% of girls have had sexual bondage online where you tie up somebody, you rip them, and then have sex. You know, what is that teaching anybody about the intimacy that should be between a man and wife? This is a very bothersome statistic that's only been out a couple of years. So it's children who are under 10 now account for almost a quarter of those who view internet pornography of all children under 18. So if you think all the children who are under 18, a quarter of them who are viewing internet pornography are, are 10 and under. So it's really hitting a very young age of child. Um, so I think this is key where, where adults are very important. Um, also pornographers use the names such as Pokemon or Action Man to appeal to children. Does anybody know what um, mousetrapping is? 
Well, mouse trapping is when a child would click on a site and it opened up to pornography. Then they click on a site again. It's more pornography. And it's deliberately done by the pornographers to expose these children to pornography. So again, parents, social workers, teachers, those who work with youth, you know, ask these children, tell them, you know, if this happens to you and you get something online that, you know, has to do with, you know, people that aren't dressed or, or and you're kind of uncomfortable about it, let's talk about it. You know, you didn't do anything bad, but, you know, I can help you work through some of this. So they aren't afraid because something with nudity or sexuality can make persons feel ashamed and then want to hide. So what are the implications of internet pornography? There's now a group of individuals suffering from internet pornography that did not exist before the internet came into being. And guess what group of individuals that is? A whole group of individuals, teenage boys. There is a growing number of persons who have an addiction now that did not have an addiction before internet became available and it's because of internet pornography. And this is worldwide. And now there's a growing number of girls who are also becoming addicted and they have young developing brains. So I've hit some of the hard areas of internet pornography or the internet misuse, but I wanna go now to shift to look at some of the effects that are common to most all of us possibly at some point in time. This is a study done by the American Psychological Association and they wanted to look at individuals who described feeling stress as um, checking their phone. So a source of stress, a significant source of stress by their self-report was constantly checking their phones. And so 23% who constantly check their phones describe more stress than those who don't check their phones very often. So what is it about checking your phone more often that makes you feel more stressful? Here's social media. I worry that the negative effects of social media on my physical and mental health. So those that become younger and younger in age who use social media more and more describe more and more a worry about negative effects of social media on physical health and mental health. So, you know, again, those of us who are doing research and looking into this area, we're trying to figure out what this was about. Um, this is one high school students, again, the more often they use their phones, the more they described anxiety. And I'll say a little bit about that when I talk about the neurophysiology. This is another study by the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Group, where they noted that those youth who are eighth graders in this study, who spend more time on social media, gaming, texting, and video chatting on their phones, exhibited more depression and anxiety than those who played sports, went outside, attended religious services, and interacted with real human beings. So there's something about the real face-to-face -face interactions that seemed to be protective as compared to those who had very little and had most screen time socialization, which they found that they complained of and had some you know, officially diagnosed higher symptoms of depression and anxiety. And these devices have spawned some novel 21st century neuroses, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out. You know, for all the power to link persons day and night, social media has exacerbated the age old concern of feeling left out. And this fear of missing out is affecting self-esteem and contributing to feelings of inadequacy. So this is a study done uh, on 8th, 10th, and 12th graders between 89 to 2015. And that's a long period of time. And you see, once you start to hit 2007 on up, there's a peak rise in these individuals self-reporting. I can't do anything right. My life is not useful. I don't enjoy life. You know, how sad to have such young persons begin to feel this way about their life. Um, and so I, what we're looking at as we look at this a little bit more deeper lens is that these individuals who see most of their socialization online and they see what's posted, they have this false notion that, that their, their friends have a better life than they do, that they always post what's happy and everything is wonderful. But if they were face to face with them, they would more appreciate that they also have struggles as well and can talk about them and that's happening less. So with this, um, amount of stimulation to the brain from all the sight and sound, 
there has been anxiety, but over time it creates a depression, a biochemical depression. And I can tell you as a psychiatrist that once you have a biochemical depression, you're possibly 50% 50, 50 more likely to have a depression later in life. And now because we're seeing this in younger and younger individuals, they're more likely to have more episodes of clinical depression for the more decades they have to live. So um, this is also another study that there's been a significant rise. There's almost a doubling of suicide-related hospital admissions between 2008 and 2015 of you know, individuals who are 5 to 11, 12 to 14, and 15 to 17. So this is a huge jump. Um, of suicide um, that's increasing again. It's not just social media, but it's also, you know, the lack of feeling connected with real people and maybe the lack of connectedness even within their own home that is affecting some of these things that are becoming concerning to families, to youth ministers, to mental health providers. This is another study here that's looked at um, individuals and driving. And so they have found that Gen X, for example, who were born between 1965 and 79, they were the ones that wanted to go to the DMVs, almost maybe spend the night, but you know, at the DMV in order to get their license to have that freedom away from home, being able to drive. But it's found now that the iGens were born after 1997. That's not the case that more than one in four teenagers do not have a driver's license by the end of high school. Why? Because they're less likely to feel like they have to leave home. In fact, they're very comfortable in their bedrooms because that's where they socialize on their phones. So you see here, the iPhone was released in 2007, and this is how there's a gradual decline in the number of individuals that are also you know, seeking to leave their home. When you see also 2007 when the iPhone came out, this is how persons are more describing themselves as feeling lonely. So more of them describe, I, I feel left out. I feel lonely. Um, and these are eighth, 10th and 12th graders. And there's a spike in that since the iPhone was released. So again, that's not the only reason. It's not just the iPhone. Sometimes it's also, you know, their personality and social skills, but everything else. It's hard to develop interpersonal social skills with an iPhone and it's, you know, than it would be with face-to-face -face interactions. So having considered some of the psychosocial aspects of the internet, I want to look at behavioral addictions. Um, because for decades, neuroscientists believed that only drugs or alcohol or other um, chemicals could stimulate an addiction. But more recent research has demonstrated that certain behaviors do produce and actually do produce brain responses that are also seen in drug addiction. So let's review a little bit um, some basic neurology. So this right here is the prefrontal cortex. It's called the executive function. It's up above our eyes here. And it's very important for self-regulation, for self-discipline. Um, it's involved in um, planning, um, thinking what you're going to do, um, judging. Um, and it's modulated a lot by the neural um, transmitter dopamine and also has serotonin pathways. Then, then there's also this nucleus accumbens right here and the ventral tegmental area where dopamine is produced and then circulated to the rest of the brain. And the amygdala is involved with a lot of emotional memories um, and has to do also with withdrawal. Um, this is um, half of the brain right here. So this is area right here that I've just described is called the reward circuit or the pleasure center. And so a lot of this is very early on if a child is hungry, if a child is thirsty, or if a child is hurt, this is the area that's stimulated. Um, and I really like the fact that when God created us, he made the things that we needed to survive pleasurable. So if we're really hungry, you know, it's, it, it creates a desire to eat. If we're really thirsty, a desire to drink. And then also the, the sexual desires, you know, in, in the appropriate vocation of procreation. So all of this is, you know, stimulated in the brain in its proper ordering. But you see here that these pathways 
need to be used to be developed. So you see how far you have to go to the prefrontal cortex to plan, to self-regulate. And this little lime green pathway here says, okay, you've had enough to drink, you've had enough to eat, you know, there's been enough sexual stimulation to kind of put into proper perspective what is going to be healthy. Um, and if this is not developed, then this kind of runs almost autonomously and, and it begins to cut off this pathway or make it very fragile and weak such that it doesn't, it's not able to regulate this area. And that's what we're seeing with the excess stimulation, the visual and auditory um, images that come from an iPhone specifically and also the, you know, that hit the ears. So this is a pigeon that was studied 40 years ago by a psychologist and he noted that when pellets of food were dropped at unpredictable times, more dopamine was secreted in these pigeons' brains. And dopamine is like, it's, the, it's this desire um, chemical. It makes you desire to get the food. It makes you want it. It makes you seek it. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who developed um, the face, uh, Facebook about 2004, you know, it was a passive, almost college directory where there'd be a picture of someone and their name, but not many people picked it up. So he wanted more people to pick it up again. So he had his neuroscientists look at this experiment to see what could create what the pigeons did to want to seek more of what they liked. And so what do you think was developed? The like button. So people were kind of gambling, you know, when were they going to get, um, you know, uh, a like, somebody's going to look at their photo, they're going to post something. And that completely changed Facebook and many other social media sites then do, did the exact same thing. So what he did and what has subsequent, subsequently been done is harnessing what is called the power of unpredictable positive feedback or variable reinforcement, where more dopamine is released. And that's the, I, I like, I want it. I want to seek more of what was pleasurable, um, which was also found in these pensions. Then now you remember your high school um, psychology of Pavlov's dogs, you know, he rang a bell, actually it was a metronome, but he rang a bell, put down food, rang a bell, put down food. Every while he rang the bell, didn't put any more food down and the dogs began to salivate to the bell. So now you have this operant conditioning. So you add a tweet or you add a ding to the post and it makes you want to just check your phone. So all of this is creating an active stimulation in that pleasure center, which makes you then obsess or feel compulsively moved to seek what is being triggered in your brain to tell you this is pleasurable. I want more. I want more. Let me seek more. And that's how um, the overstimulation is contributing to being anxious because that causes come in some agitation in the brain because it's not able to rest calmly anymore. And that's what we're finding when we're looking at um, some of these um, functional MRI scans and some of these high-tech PET scans. Now, when is it that, you know, the iPhone came out? I told you it was 2007. And when did the iPad come out? You know, approximately, you know, 2010. So when did Steve... Um, jobs give his children an iPad or an iPhone? Never, never. And when did Evan Williams, who was the co-founder of Twitter, give his um, boys, um, you know, an iPad? Again, he gave them a lot of books. So what do you think of the fact that some of these main designers of these electronic devices never gave their children these devices because they they knew the effect they would have on their developing brains. It's something to kind of pause and think about. So online gaming, that's been studied um, because uh, World of Warcraft was a really popular game. And they found that many individuals describe themselves as being really compulsively drawn to it or almost addicted to it. Um, and if World of Warcraft was a nation, there's so many players involved that um, it would be the 12th largest nation. Um, so persons are in a guild and they create an avatar and they go on these, you know, epics where they're 
um, guildmates in Japan or Estonia or Paris and all time zones such that they aren't getting sleep, they're missing classes the next day, they're not doing their homework. So over time, this stimulation has created some changes in the developing brain. So there's cortical thickness abnormalities in late adolescence. So there's less thickness in the frontal lobe, which is where there's self-regulation. There's abnormal white matter and dark matter volume in internet gaming addicts where there's less volume that helps kind of regulate because this is overstimulated in the pleasure center. So what's the effect of that? You see increased impulsivity, impaired decision-making, decreased motivation to set goals and, uh, and complete tasks. So this was not expected um, before the internet came out. And so this is a proposed diagnosis that came out in the latest DSM-5, and it has all the symptoms of substance abuse disorders. That is now a condition for further study. Um, this is a pediatrician who wanted to look at what are some things that are being posted on YouTube kids apps? And she found spliced into Minecraft, which is a popular video game for kids, that it depicted shootings. It, can, it depicted cartoons suggesting human trafficking, a child who committed suicide by stabbing, another one who attempted suicide by hanging. And then there's another uh, um, Nintendo game that she looked at that got Splatoon and spliced into that. There was um, an individual come up like this who says, remember kids, sideways for attention, long ways to results, how to end it. So teaching kids how to successfully suicide. So again, parents, youth ministers, teachers, you know, talk to kids about what might be on these kids' apps and, you know, engage with them, something that's concerning to them. Also watch what your kids are accessing because just because it says kids doesn't mean it has only safe material. Well, having overviewed some of these difficulties, I want to again underscore that the internet is a wonderful tool and it's not intrinsically bad and people of all ages can make very good use of the technology for communication, for business, social exchange, but we don't know how much Googling is too much for the developing mind or the mature mind. And although scientists has really tried to look at this, it's been hard to get some specific answers, but they do say that there's some things that we do know that can help, you know, purify the mind and imagination. If, if it has to do with pornographic images, of course you destroy the pornographic material, install a filter both on the router as well as on the individual devices. And this is Protect Young Eyes. It's a great site for parents to look at because they have a lot of things that they keep up that can be helpful for parents. An accountability partner can also be helpful. There's a lot more I could say about this in pornography, but I don't want to make that the focus of this presentation. Our Catholic faith, we have tremendous graces in the sacraments of reconciliation of the Eucharist and also reading sacred scripture that can help. Um, but again, how to establish a healthy plan. You know, say no to notifications, they're automated, they're not even people related. So is it something you wanna be notified about? Remove social apps from your cell phone or at least move them away from your main screen and only have on your main screen what it is that you really need to look at. Use an, an old fashioned alarm clock. Too many people use their cell phone for the alarm clock and then again engage in too many things when they're really losing sleep um, instead. Um, okay, no phones in the bedrooms, in the chapel, in meal times, no texting or driving. And again, you know, how often, you know, are we having a conversation with someone and the phone goes off or dings and, you know, it says, do you mind if I strap your phone to my forehead so I can pretend that you're looking at me when I talk? Um, read an actual book. The slowing down also of handwriting can be very helpful. That engages the prefrontal lobe. Um, working outside. And also, you know, what about quieting the mind? You know, what about a media fast? Consider giving up a screens for a whole day as a family or as a group of friends and reflect on your screen-free day. What did you notice? You know, how was your screen-free day compared to a day you were using screens? What did you notice when you're interacting face-to-face -face with others for a day? Were you able to do something because you weren't engaged in your screens? I think those are things that can be very helpful for individuals. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics set up new guidelines since the pandemic. Um, and they say that face-to-face -face anytime, and that has been consistent with a parent guiding the child through the experience, but with one caveat, they want the parent or whoever is looking at FaceTime with the child to think of the screen time as walking in the park and saying to the child, oh, hey, look at the ducks here. Look at the smell of the flowers, you know, kind of 
put bringing out what's on FaceTime for the child so they're really interacting with the adult that they're talking to. And that kind of helps guide the, the child through the experience. And that seems to work all right. This um, 18 months to five years, it used to be two hours of screen time of entertainment. Now it's one hour recommended. They don't set up specific screen time for older children, but if they say set up, you know, a timetable, you know, an hour for exercise and maybe eight to 10 hours for sleep, time for homework, time for family time, and then what's left should be then the screen limit time. Um, another addition is they really suggest limits for parents, especially no screen time for a parent at meals. No screen time for a parent when there's a parent-child playtime. Because what they've noticed is that when the parent is on the screen, if they're out for a walk with their child or, or they're at the meals, there's less face-to-face -face interaction. So there's less conversational interpersonal skills being um, modeled so the child can learn from. And that's really how we bond emotionally is through the, so those interpersonal actual human interactions, much more so than just what's on the screen itself. And so what you want is you want to have the child plug into you and not into the screens. And Cardinal Seurat says, I do not simply mean not to interrupt what someone else is saying, but an interior silence. Without silence, God disappears in the noise. And this noise becomes all the more obsessive because God is absent. Isn't that something that there's so much stimulation that you, it, it's clogging up any space to pause, to ponder, to pray, to be present to who's before you. And I know you can experience that yourself. It can be very fatiguing to surf the web. So enough sleep, healthy eating, good exercise. And then key to really affective maturity is to grow in self-knowledge. But if I'm not aware of what's happening to me, I can't bring myself to have some self-knowledge. And if I don't have self-knowledge, then I can't make some you know, self-direction, make some choices in my life, which helping with some self-control. And with that, I'm really become much more free in how I do what I do and why I do it, rather than kind of you know, be Im impelled just to do it because I have this trigger now that makes you want to do it without much thinking. Um, so this is a book that I've written called Screen Addiction, Why You Can't Buy, Put Down Your Phone. It's available in on root books and media slash screen time. You can also get it on Amazon, but you won't find also this little video. It's five and a half minutes, and it kind of reviews some of the um, neurophysiology that I've just described. It's an animated little video, and I developed it because I was asked often, you know, what can we do for our church group, our youth groups, our parents? And so these are discussion booklets for parents, for young adults, and for teens that are free. You can get it off this website. And then you can make sure this little video and have discussions with the particular group of how you want to set up maybe family time or youth group times that be educational for those that are involved, as well as for those who are facilitating. And then the booklets for facilitators have a little bit more um, direction. So I'd like to close with a quote from Pope St. John Paul II in his book, Communications Day Message of 2002, where he said the internet causes billions of images to appear on millions of computer monitors around the planet. From this galaxy of sight and sound will the face of Christ emerge and the voice of Christ be heard. For it's only when his face is seen and his voice is heard that the world will know the glad tidings of our redemption. This is the purpose of evangelization. And this is what will make the internet a genuinely human space. For if there's no room for Christ, there is not room for man. Therefore, I dare to summon the whole church bravely to cross this new threshold and put out into the deep of the net so that now, as in the past, the great engagement of the gospel and culture may show to the world the glory of God on the face of Christ. May God bless all of those who work for this aim.